Good morning from me also. So it's invisible, inconclusive, and incurable. As patients mostly are mostly symptomless. It's uh, really heterogeneous. Some patients may survive for decades, thus sharply contrasting others who may experience very aggressive disease. And we know that this likely reflects the underlying biological heterogeneity. Diagnosis and treatment initiation do not coincide for the great majority of patients, and it's an incurable disease. It's a rather toxic mix. It's a disease of aged individuals. The great majority of patients are 70 or older. And here is a projection of uh, <clears throat> the global population above the age of 60, a projection to 2050. And it shows that in particular in developing countries, we are going to experience a sharp increase. And this is how spending on health increases with age which to me tell us, if you take them all together, that there is a major challenge <clears throat> and there is a major global challenge. And this challenge is how to improve CLL patient care while ensuring sustainability. Because if you care for the individual patient, you need to offer the best. But none, none of us is living alone. So we should be thinking about people next to us and people who will come after us. Precision medicine may be the answer. It's a cliche. All of us speak about precision medicine without really knowing exactly what it is. So it is a hype word. But it does make sense to move from the current situation where you give a drug with no really knowing or taking into consideration the pronounced heterogeneity of any disease, and the drug is effective in 20% of the target population, and you just throw it in 80%. You are throwing money, and perhaps you may even harm patients. Now, the tailored approach means that you would be giving different treatments for the blue group, the gray group, the red group, and the cyan group. This will be far more effective and very likely far more safe. Thankfully, as uh, Chris and uh, Ben and many of us have uh, um, said these days, we've experienced a revolution in the treatment of CLL and we have now drugs targeting many of these things from surface molecules expressed on B cells. These are monoclonal antibodies on the upper left of, the, uh, of this graph to molecules targeting the signaling process initiated from the B cell receptor and other receptors like ibrutinib, bacalabrutinib, beta-lalisib. We also have immunotherapies like CAR T cells immunomodulators that interfere with the process of interaction between CLL cells and T cells like lenalidomide or PD-1 inhibitors. We also have molecules targeting the anti-apoptotic resistance mechanisms like venetoclax. So we are happy. We have too many drugs, in fact, and you, I agree with Chris, we have far too many trials, in fact, many more than would be really helpful for drawing solid conclusions. So you've seen this slide. There is a major challenge, but to me, a very, very a real major challenge is which diagnostics? Because this will be essential if we want to realize precision medicine in this disease. So 
the essence of precision medicine is making educated choices. And making educated choices means prognosis. And uh, our forefather, a Greek, Hippocrates, said this. And it was nice to note what he said, to notice what he said, that by foreseeing and foretelling, the physician will be acquainted with the circumstances of the sick, and he will manage the cure best, he who has foreseen what is to happen for the present state of matters. So we need prognostic markers, we need prognostic indices, and the ideal prognostic index should be easily applied, widely accessible, should identify distinct risk groups, be reflective of the disease biology, reproducible and cost effective. Do we have any such index? The answer is a huge, big, loud no. We are far from it. These indices would benefit the physicians because they would uh, be at a better situation, they would be at a better position for deciding about the follow-up strategy and perhaps decide about the treatment choice. I'm saying perhaps, but I should say definitely decide better about the treatment choice. Just think about P53, where we said no chemoimmunotherapy. Patients would of course be empowered if they had solid prognostic information because they would be able to decide to understand what is best for them. The industry would benefit because the elucidation of the pathophysiology underlying the clinical outcome is essential for further pharmacological drug development, but this would also assist in risk stratification and clinical trials. And society at large would benefit because of, you know, stratifying means maximizing benefits and minimizing costs and toxicities. So it is a huge benefit. You've heard many of us speak about clinical staging. This is the Binet clinical staging. It was proposed 35 years ago and it segregates patients very nicely. So if you are early in a clinical stage, this is the top line. You're having a survival, you're having a long, far longer survival <clears throat> compared to, for instance, Binet stage C, which is really doing bad. So when you have advanced stage at diagnosis, the prognosis is not good. This is a study that we published last year, and this study tells you exactly the same. So you'd say, are we happy with this? No, we are not happy with this. Because when Jacques-Louis Binet published his staging system, 50% of patients were classified as Binet A. In other words, only 50% were in early clinical stage. Whereas today, 80% are in early clinical stage. And we know that amongst these early stage, early clinical stage patients, there will be many, many different clinical courses. In other words, some of Binet stage A patients will be experiencing an indolent disease for many years, sharply contrasting others, who will have a very aggressive disease with fast evolution. So can, what can we do in order to understand the differing clinical courses that you see in the um, lower panel? We should study the interaction between the tumor and the tumor microenvironment, and we did that. But the key to understanding it was introducing molecular biology methods, analyzing the DNA, being able to, you know, really go to and decipher the code, the genetic code of the cells. A turning point in this was the uh, 
the complete reading of the human genome, the complete sequence. This happened in 2001. And we can read a lot. We can read part of a gene. You've heard us refer to mutations. This is a book chapter, if you will. We can read the book, an entire gene. But we can also read a library, so the entire DNA. As you understand, the difference in scale is enormous. Because if you read the book chapter, it's easy, fast, doable. But what about reading the library? Is it doable? The answer is yes. But the question is, what do you do when you don't know which book to open? So you're using this technique. Again, you've heard it many times during this event. Next generation sequencing. It's a very stupid term. The term was introduced in 2008 because at that time it was really next generation. Today we should call it high throughput sequencing because this method is producing many, 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 many sequence, sequences for each particular part of the DNA. Okay. So the end, the output of any high throughput sequencing experiment is many, many, many sequences. And of course, this means chaos. And we need advanced tools and pipelines for making order out of chaos. And this entails analysis, pattern discovery, and modeling. Now, these novel techniques allow you to study the whole genome, the apple, allows you to study only the parts of the genome that encode for proteins, because not everything in our DNA is encoding proteins. We call this the exome. Or we can study individual genes or parts of genes, thin slices of the apple. Now, if you go, <clears throat> if you analyze thin slices, you can re go really deep. You can have thousands of, many thousands of sequences for each particular slice. So you can be highly sensitive. So the hand has begun. And there have been true landmarks in the analysis of the CLL cancer genome. I'm highlighting here just a few seminal publications. And we have now a really long list of genes that are found to be mutated in CLL. But there is an interesting thing. Individually, each of these genes is dysfunctional in no more than 5% of cases, which tells you how heterogeneous this disease is. Now, the genes highlighted in color, the genes in red, have been found to have a prognostic significance, and in the case of TP53, a predictive significance. What about the others, though? This is a, a UK study by David Osier and many others, including Chris. So this study showed that in addition to TP53, these two genes, NOTCH1 and SF3B1, turned out to have an independent prognostic, negative prognostic value. The German, the famous study compared establishing FCR as a very effective treatment. It tells you again about SF3B1, but it also tells you another thing. Notch 1 mutations, a new kid in, on the block, Notch 1, if patients were mutated, they were not experiencing any benefit from rituximab. Let's look at it more closely. So, this is what happens on the top. There is really a very, very significant difference in outcome. Patients were doing much better with FCR if they had no problem in the notch one gene. 
but mutated patients had no difference in outcome. It was exactly the same. So we were throwing money away with rituximab. You want to see another anti-CD20 antibody of atumumab? It's the same result. So if you have a mutation in the notch one gene, no benefit from afatumumab. So I will ask you a very simple question. Would you want to know about the status of notch one before deciding whether you will give or receive an anti-CD20 antibody? Personally, I would definitely want to know. The cost of this test is roughly 80 euros. Now we've sequenced more than 1,000 patients. These are initiatives led by Elias Campo in Barcelona and Kathy Wu at Harvard. So the question would be, or the uh, hypothesis would be, are we approaching completion? The answer is no, because we don't know there is a long list, but also a long tail. And we don't know what is hidden in the tail, and I'm showing you now what our group has found in only one year. So just think, one research consortium found two genes in less than one year. Both genes are found in aggressive CLL. You can forget about gene names. What I'm telling you is that these genes are also predictive of aggressiveness. And you've seen this slide from Ben, I think. This is an Italian study. So the Italians thought, fine, it's nice to search for TP53. We can do it with a traditional approach, but we can do it with the high throughput approach. And each bar in this graph represents a particular patient, and the bars in red depict cases who were found to carry TP53 mutations in a small fraction of the clone. And you would, we would not be able to detect these mutations if we hadn't used a high throughput approach. And you could ask me, should we care about that? And the answer seems to be yes. Because three independent studies from Italy on the left, from the Czech Republic in the middle, and from Spain on the right, have shown the exact same thing. That even if you have a small mutant subclone, you are doing very badly. Which is why, within ERIC, we have launched this study, targeted high throughput sequencing of the TP53 gene in CLL. We are hoping to have the results, at least with regards to the methodology, next June. And we are going to launch a study that will also explore the clinical implications. Because we, there is a consensus that TP53 is essential, no doubt about it. The question is, how deep we need to go, and this is the type of answer that we hope to get. But CLLs are made for public relations, and this is critical for signaling the communication with the environment. And when they turn nasty, out of the many different lymphocytes, the black one gets nasty and all its progeny will express the same immunoglobulin. And there is now plenty of evidence that the immunoglobulin is critical for the survival and proliferation of the cells. So studying the immunoglobulin makes a lot of sense. And we did study the immunoglobulin and by doing it, we realized that when the immunoglobulin genes carry somatic mutations, it's this, it's this M here, mutated immunoglobulins, the prognosis is far superior compared to cases carrying unmutated immunoglobulins, UM here. And you've also heard us emphasize this that for those patients who are fit 
and can receive FCR, there is a hell of a difference if the immunoglobulin genes are mutated. So three studies published within the, the last year telling exactly the same thing, that the outcome will be much better if the immunoglobulin genes are mutated. So I will ask you, would you want to know about the mutational status of the immunoglobulin before deciding about whether you will give FCR? The cost of this analysis is no more than 150 euros. So, we have progressed considerably, but there is clearly room for improvement. It's absolutely clear that we need to match particular patient profiles with available treatments, but it is also absolutely clear that we need to do a personalized modeling of disease evolution, taking into consideration interacting determinants of health. And just to give you an idea what I mean by that, when you have comorbidities like heart failure or depression, your lifestyle will be different. And when you are stressed and depressed, this may affect your gene expression. This is not lay science. This is studies published in the, in the most prestigious scientific journals within the last two or three years. When you have an active immune system, you can contain the tumor, you can control the tumor. When you have uncontrolled high blood lipids, you will have inflammation, and inflammation sustains the tumor. When you eat differently, your microbiome in the gut will be different, and your apoptotic process in the in the body will be different. Have we addressed all these issues? The answer is a big no. Should we do it? I think there is an obvious answer that you can draw yourselves. Thank you really very much for your attention and I thank all these people with whom I have the honor and the great pleasure of collaborating. Uh, Lea from Israel. And I have to disclose that I'm also a statistician. And many years ago, I also worked in medical statistics in a hospital, a big hospital in Israel. And this is an observation and a question to all that we heard in the medical side here, which was wonderful, eye-opening. I, I don't have enough superlatives for what we heard from all of you, and it was wonderful. But as a statistician, probably I see numbers a little different than people which are not statisticians. And it seems to me that as statistics does, it concentrates on the middle, on what happens usually, what happens mostly. And it, it, it forgets the edges many times. And many times the wonderful things happen in the edges. And many times what we really have to find are in the edges. And unfortunately, many doctors today are um, imprisoned or captive of this statistical um, vision, statistical looking. You ask the question, a doctor and says 80%, 60%, 30%, 40%. What it means to me? I'm not a statistician. I don't understand what it means. 20% is good or 20% is bad because sometimes 20% is wonderful. Sometimes it's a disaster. And in the same spirit, medicine is a little bit art, is a little bit creativity. So gut feeling, guts to do something which is not exactly what is written in all the thousands and thousands of articles. And many doctors now are a little imprisoned also in the articles, in the state of art. Just as an anecdote, many years ago I had a, a, a tumor in my um, inner gland and 
and it was removed and for, for 10 years I was tested, everything was okay and 14 years later, I don't know why I wanted uh, some test and I made the test and when I came with the result, you know what the doctor told me? How come did you make this result after 14 uh, this test after 14 years? It's written that after 10 years you don't have to have the result. But you know what the result of the test was? That the tumor came back. So some, something has to be, you know, a little bit released here. So the doctors will be comfortable to, to take mm. a decision which is not in the books, which is not the popular one. Maybe it's the right one for this person. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think that's really insightful. What, one of the ways that we can explore that as, as clinicians is to take it straight back as an individual level. And, and I often say, look, this is, this is something that may happen or may not happen. And my thinking is that for many people, life and death is binary. So things can happen or they don't happen. It's not going to 60% happen or 40% happen, it either will it won't. So for you, it's zero or one. And it renders the, a lot of the statistics completely meaningless when you bring it back down to that individual level. So I think sometimes, I, you know, as I'm a simple person, I really think in terms of something is or it isn't, it's binary. And that's life and death. Dr. Stefanovic. But uh, rather than philosophizing about it, you mentioned it beautifully, that medicine is not a science. Okay, but going beyond philosophy to actual things and speaking about the heterogeneity and what you said, you've seen, you've heard this name, SF3B1. Okay, we mentioned that it is a new gene that is recurrently mutated in CLL. If you ask any CLL specialist what is the frequency of mutations in this gene, he or she will tell you 5%. Okay, now, there are subgroups in CLL, one in particular, where the frequency of mutations in this gene is 60%. Ben was asked to talk about ECLL1 disease. You spoke about statistics. Can you please combine the two facts and tell me, <laughs> is statistics telling you the truth about SF3B1 in CLL? I should say yes, but which CLL? <laughs> okay. So there is the art to know to, and, and I have a feeling that all these statistics is a kind of a guardian that, that a doctor will not make a big mistake. But we don't expect doctors not to make mistakes. We expect them to do good things. Yes, but you don't manage your patients based on statistics and clinical protocols and guidelines. This is why you are not, you know, you are not reading uh, study results before you decide about how you manage your patient. You have the evidence, but you have also the experience and also the common sense. And, and we all have you know, stories of trials that were unsuccessful, that didn't show statistical value, but there was a handful of patients who did fabulously well on a therapy that didn't work and are still doing well 10 years later. I think we have time for one more quick question. We're really over time, but um, go ahead. This was a very interesting section, so thank you very much. What I'm sitting as to think about now is that Chris said there was a thousand studies going on right at the moment, and that's in the first respect sounds quite fabulous and very nice. But then if I start to think a little bit more critical about it, when I heard with the population of these studies, they don't really represent the typical CLL patient. And then I think, okay, how representative will it then be? And then I also think when you have so many studies going on, what, how is it in your field to use systematic reviews? Because I've been to a seminar with, um, in a different field where they, they actually encourage patient organization to, to, to 
uh, say that we don't want to participate in a clinical study if it's not based on a systematic review. How is that in your field? If, do they use systematic reviews to summarize what's already known before they start new research, just to avoid redundant research? Thank you. Um, the answer to that on the whole is no. As I say, there's really two sources of, of studies. There's the academic departments around the world, universities, who are actually developing their own research ideas and want to test them out. And then there's the commercial sector. Uh, the commercial sector wouldn't do a, a review uh, of that sort. It's, it's, it's not in the charity uh, field. It's in the commercial field. It's a completely different thing. Most academics are really sad people who know their field back to front. Uh, they probably would tell you they don't need to do a systematic review. I don't think there's many cases really where you've gone right through the study and the study shown what you thought and then you've realized there's not much of a need for it. So I think actually the proof of it is most of these studies do deliver something at the end of the day for patients without that process. But one of the interesting things, and, and I, mean, I don't know what it's like, but the take-up of rabinituzumab as frontline therapy has been nowhere near what they would have thought in the UK from the efficacy of the drug. And maybe people were just were really very happy with clarambosil rituximab. So in fact, the data is not everything, that survival is not everything, but a systematic review would have told you we can do better than rituximab. And they've done better with Taxamab, but that still doesn't necessarily mean they have a thriving market for their drug. Uh, 